At the age of four, she was stolen from her mother and raised under a fake identity. She later married her own serial killer stepfather and likely died because of his jealousy. Did she know who she really was? And how was such a smart girl seemingly so manipulated? This is the story of Sharon Marshall, the woman who finally got her real name back 14 years after her death. Hi friends, I'm Katie, and this is Katie Does Crime. Thank you so much for your continued support of my channel and the amazing comments you've been leaving me. On April 25th, 1990, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed beauty named Tanya Don Hughes was injured and died five days later after a suspicious hit-and-run accident outside of the hotel where she was staying in Oklahoma City. It's said that as she lay dying in the hospital, she kept calling for her daddy. The number one suspect was her husband, Franklin Delano Floyd. The controlling Franklin had told her he would use police connections to track her down and kill her if she ever tried to leave him, and she was trying to leave him. 20-year-old exotic dancer Tanya was working up the guts to run away with a college student she met at the strip club. That same month she decided to leave Franklin, she was bringing groceries over from a convenience store to her hotel when she was struck from behind by a car. Franklin claimed that he had been at the hotel with her when she'd left, but he'd fallen asleep shortly after. Authorities were skeptical. Trouble seemed to follow Franklin wherever he went. Franklin Delano Floyd, you have to love that name, was born in Barnesville, Georgia in 1943. His alcoholic father died from kidney and liver failure when Franklin was only a year old, and his mother moved the remaining family in with her parents. It was too much for the grandparents to have so many people in their small apartment, however, and they asked their daughter to leave and take the children with her. With nowhere else to go, Franklin and his siblings were left to the care of a children's home, where he was bullied and abused for being feminine and had his hand dipped into hot water for touching himself. When Franklin escaped the home and was caught stealing from a nearby neighbor, his older sister was forced to take the teenager in exchange for keeping him out of jail. But Franklin, always in trouble, was soon kicked out of his sister's house and decided to go out in search of his mom. He found her in Indianapolis, working as a prostitute. She helped him forge the documents that would allow him to enlist in the army as a minor, but they quickly discovered the lie and kicked him out. Franklin was alone and a drifter, traveling across the U.S. wreaking havoc. He was shot in the stomach by police while trying to steal a gun from a Sears department store at the age of 16. He violated his parole by crossing the border to go fishing. As a 19-year-old, he stole a four-year-old from a bowling alley and assaulted her in the nearby woods. He escaped from prison after being convicted for that crime and then robbed a bank. He was repeatedly assaulted by other inmates while doing time for that crime, which made him climb the roof of the prison and threaten to off himself. He was later released to a halfway house, and then two months later, he was allowed out on his own completely, where he immediately abducted a woman at a gas station and assaulted her in his car. He was arrested again, but a former prison pal posted his bail, allowing him to escape into oblivion. He never showed up for court. By 1974, Franklin was using an alias, Brandon Williams, and met a mother of four named Sandy Chipman Savakis at a truck stop. They dated for a whole month before she and Franklin got married and moved in together in Dallas, Texas. Now, Sandy went to jail in 1975 for writing a bad check while trying to buy diapers. While she was serving her 30 days, her dear husband Franklin Floyd was left at home with the kids. But when she arrived back home, they were all gone. The two middle girls were found in social services later, but her oldest, Suzanne, and youngest, Philip, had seemingly disappeared. She attempted to file kidnapping charges, but was ignored because Franklin was the stepfather. There appears to be no record of Franklin's life for the following 15 years, but when we pick back up with him in 1989, this is where we find Franklin Floyd married to Tanya Don Hughes, the woman later killed in the hit and run. At the time of her death, Tanya and Franklin were suspects in a disappearance case. A coworker of Tanya's couldn't be found and people had seen them having a fight with her outside of the Mons Venus Strip Club where the two worked as dancers. The co-worker had reported Tanya for not claiming all of the income she made at the club, which caused Tanya to lose her Medicaid coverage for her son. 
Witnesses had seen Franklin in a huge argument with the coworker, and he had told her she was going to regret hurting his family. And then she disappeared. Franklin and Tanya quickly moved away, and investigators ruled that a suspicious fire that burned through their trailer was intentional arson. What were they trying to hide? When Tanya died in the hit and run, the two were still persons of interest in the case, so Franklin put their two-year-old son, Michael, into the state's care and fled. Michael's foster parents decided to begin adoption proceedings, and when Franklin's DNA was collected to establish paternity, it turned out that Michael wasn't actually his son. So when he later tried to get custody of Michael again, he was understandably denied. The fact that he'd been a criminal since the age of 16 didn't help. So one day, when Michael was in first grade, Franklin waltzed into the school, took the principal hostage, forced him to lead Franklin to Michael's classroom at gunpoint, and then loaded both of them into the principal's truck. He left the principal handcuffed to a tree in the local woods and abducted Michael, who was never seen again. When Franklin was finally arrested states away two months later, Michael was no longer with him. Franklin said he was alive and well, but refused to talk about where he was or who was providing his care. As if all of this isn't wild enough, here's where the actual story begins. As investigators looked into the hit-and-run death of Tanya Hughes and the kidnapping of her son, Michael, they found that Franklin had actually raised Tanya. He had been calling her his daughter since she was very young, and yet they didn't actually share DNA. When asked how the two ended up together, Franklin said that her biological parents had abandoned her, and he was her savior. Or that her mom had died, and he'd had to struggle as a single parent. Tanya was, of course, deceased at this point from the hit-and-run, so authorities had to guess at her origins. They figured she must have been born in the 60s and taken by Franklin Floyd between 1973 and 1975. She grew up using different names, like Suzanne Davis in elementary school, But by the time she graduated high school in 1986 with a full ride to a local college, she was known as Sharon Marshall. Her classmates said her relationship with her dad seemed a bit sinister, the way Franklin would never allow her to date and would threaten her with a gun if she tried to go out. And one time, Sharon showed a friend some lingerie her quote-unquote father had bought for her, like crotchless underwear. Despite Franklin's attempts to keep her under lock and key, she gave birth to her son Michael two years later. His real father is an old boyfriend of Sharon's named Gregory Higgs. Remember the exotic dancer co-worker of Tanya, aka Sharon, who had disappeared in 1989 after the heated argument with Franklin outside of the club where they worked? Well, her body was found six years later in 1995, and she had died from two gunshots to the head. That same year, A man bought a truck at an auction, and wedged into the undercarriage was an envelope stuffed with 97 photos. Some of them were of this co-worker, and showed her tied up, bruised, and beaten. Some of them were of a young Tanya, aka Sharon. The earliest ones were of her at four years old, in suggestive poses. In one photo, someone's thumb had gotten in the way of the camera, and an FBI analyst found it consistent with characteristics of Franklin's thumb. A boat in one of the pictures was Franklin's boat. The truck where the photos were found was the same one that had once been stolen from the school principal by Franklin Floyd. Based on this evidence, Franklin was sentenced in 2002 to death for the murder of the coworker who had disappeared. Her name was Cheryl Ann Camesso. As the sentence was read, Franklin smiled and shook his head. A journalist later wrote the book A Beautiful Child about the case, which renewed interest in the life of Tanya Hughes, a.k.a. Sharon Marshall. When the FBI interviewed Franklin in 2014, he had admitted to killing her son, Michael. He had shot Michael twice in the back of the head, the same way the co-worker had died, the very same day he kidnapped Michael from school. They were driving, and Michael was understandably not happy to be stuck in a truck with this guy who had given him up for adoption years ago, and Franklin couldn't handle it. Michael's body was never found. Franklin also revealed that the little girl he had raised as his daughter, married, and possibly later killed was really named Suzanne Marie Savakis. Born September 6, 1969 in Wayne County, Michigan, she was the oldest daughter of his first wife, the one whose children he'd stolen when she was sent to jail. Remember when I said that Franklin's first wife never found her oldest and youngest children? The oldest, Suzanne, lived a double life with Franklin as Sharon and then Tanya. 
And then in 2019, a man who was adopted as a child said he believed he may be the long-lost youngest son. DNA tests confirmed that he was right. Suzanne and Philip got their names back. In the murder case of the coworker, where Franklin was sentenced to death, an expert psychiatrist found that Franklin suffered from psychological imbalances stemming from personality disorders, emotional immaturity, and poor impulse control. Franklin says he's the illegitimate son of former FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. In jailhouse interviews, he said he should get a medal for the way he saved Suzanne and that Michael is his reason for living. You know, the little boy he killed. The court partly blames his abusive childhood for his grisly actions, but said that his 19 prior felonies and the horrific nature of the murders outweighed that. Franklin is still on death row today. Even though this case is considered solved, it's still so confusing in a way. I get that because Suzanne was kidnapped so young, she may not have known she was abducted for a long time. In her mind, she may have just been innocently living with her stepfather. Or she may not have even remembered her biological father at all. Some wonder why, if she had an IQ of 132 and was smart enough to have a scholarship to study aerospace engineering, she would allow herself to be married to her stepfather. But you have to remember that he was basically grooming her from the age of four and was so controlling that he'd threaten her with a gun in front of her friends. The theory goes that Franklin was such a domineering figure that he forced Suzanne to give up a baby that she had in high school, and he made Suzanne become an exotic dancer rather than go to college because it'd be easier to hide her true identity. She'd be working as an independent contractor at a place where her coworkers wouldn't ask too many questions. Many people have asked why her mother wouldn't have had police question Franklin, but Franklin married the woman under the false name Brandon Williams and wouldn't have been easy to trace. People also ask why Franklin was allowed to take his stepchildren away from their mother, but this was the early 1970s. Suzanne wasn't considered missing if her stepfather had her. A grave still exists for the alias Suzanne was using when she died. It says simply Tanya, no last name, and I'll always be with you. Creepy. Because Suzanne died when she was only 20 years old, we'll never have the chance to know her side of the story, nor who she would have become. It's a tragic end to a tragic childhood. Girl in the Picture, the story of the real Sharon Marshall, is set to be released on Netflix on July 6th. There will also be a podcast released starting on June 29th on the You Can't Make This Up feed. While you wait, you can watch the original Unsolved Mysteries episode about Little Michael Hughes on YouTube. I'll put the link in the description. This is a twisting and turning case where sometimes the more information you have, the less it makes sense. I hope you've enjoyed this brief recap and recommend reading A Beautiful Child if you'd like to learn more. I'll also put a link to the book below. Thank you for tuning into my YouTube video. I'm just a true crime fan like you are, and I really appreciate you taking a chance on me. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you liked spending this time together. I'd be so appreciative. Until next time, I'm Katie, and this has been Katie Does Crime. I was staying in o Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. A blue-haired, blue-eyed beauty. Oh, I just said blue-haired. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> At a truck stop. Truck, truck stop. Truck stop. Where you put the trucks. He was going to regret hurting her family. Nope, he was going to not regret anything. It's a jabra bra bra. Yeah, it'd be easier her for easier for her for her for her. It's a tragic end to a tragic childhood. Tragic? You didn't like tragic? <laughs> it's a tragic crap. <laughs> tragic is the hardest word in the whole English language. You can watch the original. Original. <laughs> I need a drink. <laughs>